Hello and welcome to this series of webinars here from Mintech. I'm Marcel Goldenberg, our Head of Proprietary Pricing here, and I'm delighted today to bring this a plant-based protein webinar to you. In fact, it's one of two webinars we are recording and we are making available to you. The first one, as you can see from the title here, will be on the global picture of protein sources and availability. Areas we're going to look at today are largely about what are plant-based proteins, where they're coming from, and what's the difference between some of them. In our second set, we will be looking at the cost structures. Why are certain proteins more expensive than others? Why are certain proteins sourced from different areas? And there'll be, we're digging down into this procurement vital information of costs on proteins. Um, to do this, as I said, we've got two sets of webinars. Um, and obviously stay tuned for the next one, which will be released shortly as well. And we're looking forward to kind of having you with this. Now, um, here's me again, a nice little picture of me. Obviously, you know that I look at plant-based protein here, among other things, are my areas of expertise within within Mintech. And today, my guest, which I'm really excited about, is uh, Denis Chiro, who is the CEO of Improve. Obviously, you've got his contact details here. Please do feel free to reach out to either Denis or myself um, at any point you wish to and uh, contact us more about questions you have or any more insights you would like to hear about this. Now, let's look at some of the key takeaways you will learn in this session. Again, as I said, they're going to be two sessions today. So today we're going to look at the global aggregate agricultural production, a difficult one, you see, um, on the plant-based protein focus in particular. What are the sources? What's the overall sector balance? We're going to look at the plant-based protein ingredients, including concentrates and isolates. What's the difference between them? Where do the concentrate cutoff levels sit? And obviously, Denny will tell us much more about the 50% level, the 80% level. And we're going to look at some future demand on protein. Um, and, you know, what, what does it look differently from country to country? So those are going to be some of the key stuff you're going to learn about. Um, we are looking or we're aiming for this webinar to be around 20 minutes, might be a little bit longer, might be a little bit shorter. And um, yeah, it's going to be largely, Denis, I might jump in every now and then to just give a quick um, follow up question on something, but it will largely be Denny talking. And then um, we'll shortly be releasing our second webinar here as well in a similar structure, but looking in particular at the cost differences. Um, now, you know most about Mintech, obviously, you've most of you have been clients for a long time. If you haven't, obviously, we have been in the industry for quite a long time. We've got about 14,000 price series that we cover and um, plant-based protein are one of these additions that we're really putting a lot of focus and attention on. Now, without further ado, Denny, I'm so pleased to have you here. Let's take it away, please. Okay, so um, uh, hello everybody. I'm uh, very pleased. Thank you for Marcel for this introduction and uh, invi inviting me to, to do this uh, presentation. So on this uh, first uh, webinar, we'll try to, to, to cover the, the different protein sources and protein availability to produce protein ingredients. And I will uh, try to, to, to tell you um, everything I know, I'll try to summarize it. Um, the the first uh, uh, thing I would like to, to to present is first Improve because I am the CEO of Improve. Improve is an R&D center. It is located uh, in France, one hour north of Paris. Uh, we started uh, a little bit uh, more than six years ago. Um, we have now 20 people in the team. We have more than 400 customers worldwide. And we try to help uh, all these customers to develop uh, innovation, new process, new products, new application. We also have a lab where we can help them to better understand the composition of their product uh, in order to, to go to the food, feed, cosmetic or uh, uh, non-food application. But most of the customers we are working with are in the food sector. Uh, we we can offer um, uh, work around uh, fractionation. So we are quite expert in dry fractionation uh, to produce concentrate. We are also expert in wet fractionation in order to produce isolate or hydrolysates. And as I said before, we have a, a strong lab um, a team able to characterize the product. We also do intellectual support like uh, patent review, scientific review, uh, market studies, technical due diligence for investors. So we can uh, trainings, uh, brainstorming sessions. So everything to animate the network and to help customers to um, develop their projects. 
So now I will uh, start the, the real presentation uh, dealing with these uh, ingredients coming from different plant sources. Um, one important thing we have to, to realize is the uh, agro production worldwide is producing more or less 10 billion tons every year. And out of these 10 billions, you, you can see that 74 person is going to feed. In fact, we want to use animals to convert plant-based protein into animal-based protein. And you see that only 18% of the agro production is going straight to the food chain. It's really limited. Uh, you can also um, see on this uh, graph that uh, only uh, less than 8% of the agro production is used for non-food application, non-food being either energy or in, uh, material uh, utilization. So first thing to, 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 to memorize is very limited use, direct use of um, agro material. Uh, the second thing is uh, that uh, this utilization is really uneven through the world because only rich countries, rich people can afford to pay for uh, animal-based protein. And you can see here that only 18% of the world population is able to use more, uh, more than 60 grams per day of animal-based protein. This graph is um, trying to also explain that uh, when we speak about uh, plant-based protein, um, we, we, we have to, to make a mass balance to better understand all the usage. So I said that 10 billion tons of agro-material are produced. This, this big volume is containing 555 million tons of uh, plant-based protein. And you can see here in this picture that 440 million tons are used to the feed um, sector in order to produce 89 million tons of animal-based protein. So the, you can see that the, the conversion yield is quite is quite low. Huh? You can see here that uh, only 20% of the yield um, uh, can be realized. So it's extremely low. Um, here you can see on the on the left part of the of the picture that from one uh, animal production to another, the yield can be quite different. You see that uh, a, a cow producing milk is uh, having a yield of 40%. It means that 60% of the protein is wasted somewhere. But it's even worse when the, 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 the ruminants are producing meat, because then you can see that 90% of the protein disappeared. Uh, insect, fish or poultry are, I would say, medium transformer. Uh, having a, 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 a yield around 35 to 40 percent. Pork is in between. So the important message is to say that uh, first, you can of course use animal to convert uh, plant-based protein, but every time you use animals, you have to know that you, have, you are losing yield. The second thing is, how can we really to, to, to save the world and to feed all these humans? How can we enlarge this red bar? And there are two ways, either using uh, the agro production, stimulating the, the farming practices, the breeding in order to produce more uh, protein uh, per hectare or producing more hectares of uh, um, protein based uh, rich plants. The other side is maybe not to become all vegans, but try to reduce a little bit the part of protein that we feed to animals, because we know that due to this uh, very low yield, uh, every ton we save will be uh, gain for, for uh, food application. What you have to know is also that only 115 million tons of plant-based protein are going to the food chain. And out of this 115, only 2.5 million tons are uh, what we call protein ingredients, concentrate or isolate. And these ingredients are mainly coming today from the, the soy. You see that 52% are soy-based protein. The, the other part is coming from the, the wheat. And you can see here that uh, the, the wheat is representing 42% of, of this uh, uh, plant-based uh, uh, ingredient. The, the, the third player, which is far behind, is, uh, is P, and you see that P is representing only 5%. And then you have a long list of very, very small players like rice, potato, rapeseed, etc. So we see every day newcomers willing to enter this uh, market, 
which is highly dominated today uh, by soy and, and wheat. So, Denny, just one yeah. question on that slide just now, if you yeah, kind of yeah. can jump back one. Yeah. Obviously, we're looking at soy, wheat and pea as being the top three. Um, yeah. How come most of the attention at the moment is around the pea? How come that's kind of the big buzzing, the cool thing that people um, are, are looking to kind of integrate in, in their products rather than, than, I mean, I think soy is the other big one people hear about, but wheat seems to be not so cool. Why, why do people not want to talk about it as much? Why is it not so mainstream? <clears throat> In fact, soy and pea, as you mentioned, are well established. They are still growing, but they are existing since years and years. Huh? The soy industry has, de has been developing since maybe uh, 40 or 50 years. Um, and they receive some comments, negative comments. Uh, I'm not saying that they are bad, but they are receiving some comments because of the GMO, because of the allergenicity, because of the uh, phyto hormones, because of the taste. So, a lot of comments are around and we see more and more people willing to escape from these two sources and to diversify the offer. Just as an example, if you are vegan today, uh, you will only eat uh, soy based material. And we know in nutrition that one important element is diversity of sourcing. So just to enlarge the offer, you need to go out of this uh, um, uh, soy and wheat base and you need to diversify. And today, one of the most important candidates is, uh, is the pea because pea is rich in protein. It's a quite well-balanced amino acid profile. It's not an allergenic uh, product. Uh, so it's answering a lot of, um, it's not GMO, so it's answering a lot of um, demands from the from the users. So it's the anticipation that the, the P market share, 5%, is likely to, to increase significantly over the next decade? Uh, significantly, yes and no, because I will show you after that there is a, a limited uh, feed, feed uh, stock uh, to, to feed this industry. And maybe uh, practice, uh, farming practices, breeders will play a role just to enlarge the pea production. But for sure, pea will continue to develop uh, and will uh, be bigger in coming years than uh, the only 5% we see right now on the screen. And which one of the 1%, and I know we're going to touch about it a little bit later again, which one of these, the 1% group now, do you think is, is going to show the, the, the biggest jump going forward in terms of um, usage globally? I, I think there are two options. One will be coming from the purse family, because behind P you have faba bean, chickpea, um, mung bean, so a lot of other beans. Uh, it's amazing the number of beans. And in all of these beans, you can get very good uh, taste, very good functional properties. So the diversity will also come from these properties. And the other family, uh, which is representing a major uh, potential, is coming from the the oil seed uh, family. So because we produce, we extract oil from uh, canola, rapeseed, and and sunflower. But you have the meal, which is also containing a lot of proteins. And there are a lot of projects going on right now on this uh, raw material. And that's a big potential because it's a big volume available, which is given to death to animals. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Let's let's kind of jump into some of the figures you're about to show them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So here I want to just to say that uh, um, uh, human diet is not the same uh, all over the world. And you see that uh, in uh, uh, developed countries, rich countries, uh, we eat much more animal-based uh, protein than uh, plant-based protein. And as you can see in Africa, it's the total opposite. It's just because, uh, as I said before, the price of, of the, the animal-based protein is much uh, higher and uh, and you, you need to, to be rich to afford uh, to, to go that. So it's also an indication for you where are the major challenges for, for the um, uh, nutritional uh, conversion. Um, and now we'll try to, to uh, speak a little bit about how can we uh, fractionate and produce uh, ingredients. And, and the first thing is to consider that different plants are having different uh, protein composition. And you see in this screen a limited number of products, but you can see that in cereals globally you are in the range of from uh, 10 to 15. The pulses can be quite, uh, uh, quite rich, even they are, if they are diversified from 20 to 40 percent uh, protein uh, content. So that's a way, first uh, thing to do is uh, to, to try to, to select your raw material depending on what you want to achieve. 
if you want really to achieve something which is extremely high in, in protein, uh, it's maybe better and cheaper to start from, uh, from a plant having a, a quite high level of protein. The, the cost, of course, of the raw material is also impacting your final ingredient cost. So that's also something which is important. This is why also the pea was a good source, because the pea uh, cost on the market is quite low. Huh? In Europe, it's around 200, 220 euro per ton compared to chickpea, lentils, which can be much higher. It's also a reason why um, a pea is growing quite nicely right now. So assuming that we, we start from a seed, then you, you do usually a cleaning, uh, a dehulling in order to remove the fibers. Uh, if necessary, you can do a, a defatting if it's a, a, a plant rich in, in fats like all seeds and you do a milling. Then you, get, get, you can get a, a flour or meal and you, you have two options. Either you go to a dry or wet extraction. The dry extraction is basically milling of the flour and doing uh, either an air classification or an electrostatic separation. And this will help you to achieve the, 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 the fractionation between the protein bodies of, the, uh, of the, uh, the flour and the other components. And depending on the raw material, the other components will be either fibers or starch or a mix of, of them. When you produce um, concentrate, you are usually achieving something which is in the range from 50 up to 65 or even 70 percent protein content on the dry matter, which is quite good considering the simplicity of the process. Another way to achieve a concentrate is to take, for example, a meal which is con still containing some uh, fats and soluble material and you do a washing. It, it's well known in the soil where the washing can be done usually using ethanol and the ethanol washing will increase the protein yield, remove some components which are not always uh, um, well positioned on your market. So undesired molecules can be removed and then you achieve the, the right purity to, to reach the concentrate family. If you really do a wet extraction, then you first solubilize your protein. You do a purification using centrifuge. And after precipitation, uh, you can go here and get the, the protein isolate, which is in the range from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 85 to 90% to protein. You can also achieve this purification using membrane filtration. Uh, it's another way to do it. Most of the protein isolate on the market right now are coming from this uh, pH metric process, meaning pre acid precipitation in order to purify the extract and achieve the isolate quality. But both of them can be uh, considered as isolate. Um, now I want to just uh, reinforce the message about when you have to start working on a P, uh, on a project, a uh, plant-based project, you have to consider how, uh, how big is the availability of the raw material. And you, you can see here, for example, that uh, out of the 10 billion tons, you remember, of agro-production, corn is representing 10% by itself, 1 billion ton. It's extremely big. You see the wheat, 750 million tons. It's extremely big. In comparison, pea is very small, only 11 million. Faba bean is, is uh, around 4 million, so extremely low. The, the total purse family is, is about um, 80 million tons. You see lupin, 1 million. Chickpea, 14 million. Alfalfa is uh, an interesting candidate because we'll commit, uh, come on it later. Uh, the world production is around uh, 60 million tons. Then you have the, the, the oil seed family where you have the soybean, uh, 360 million, the, the rapeseed and canola, 71, and uh, the sunflower, 51 million tons. So we'd say major, uh, medium, medium range of production. Um, now, if we consider uh, some of these uh, raw material, I put in, in, um, in uh, green the, the plants which are uh, nitrogen fixing plants, uh, fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. And from a agro standpoint and, and a sustainability standpoint, it's extremely important to try to rebalance a little bit 
the, the, the proportion between uh, uh, nitrogen fixing plant and uh, non fixing plant in the crop rotation. I can introduce a concept which is uh, the symbiotic nitrogen, uh, uh, which is in fact the quantity of nitrogen that you can find in your diet, which is coming from uh, uh, nitrogen coming from the atmosphere. Uh, just after the uh, World War II, this uh, symbiotic nitrogen was uh, close to 100%. Now it's below 5% in uh, developed countries. Why? Because the farming practices are using a lot of fertilizers which are coming from fossil uh, raw material. So it's important to, if we want to develop a more sustainable agriculture, to rebalance a little bit. And that's the only, uh, the only way to do it is to reintroduce in the crop rotation more uh, plant uh, nitrogen fixing uh, plants in the crop rotation and you see that for example all the pearls are extremely good candidates in addition of that they are good producers of protein you see here that the protein production per year and per hectare so a lot of them are in the range of one ton per hectare even more and i mentioned before that alfalfa is an interesting candidate luzerne or alfalfa it's it's able to produce 2.5 tons per hectare extremely good so Again, when you think about what is the future, you have also to consider what are the good candidates because we need sustainable agriculture. Now, we, if we come back to the ingredients, um, the ingredients can be divided in, in flour, concentrate, isolates, depending of the protein content. And you see uh, where we can uh, switch from one, uh, one family to, to another. Uh, that's important when you want to, to select uh, the, the different products. You have also um, some products which are uh, obtained after protein hydrolysis. So uh, hydrolysate can have specific application in, in food, supplements, in cosmetic, or uh, used as a test uh, in answer. Here in this picture, you see the diversity of the, um, uh, of the raw material. So in two years ago, we made an improve uh, a market survey, tried to identify uh, commercial product available worldwide and where they were coming from. And you can see that um, references are commercial product uh, that you can find on the market. Out of more than 1,000 different references, most of them, more than 56%, 46% uh, were coming from the soy. The P is a, a second candidate. It's extremely interesting because P, as I mentioned before, is only representing 5% of the volume. But you see that it's representing 13% uh, in a number of references, which means for me that there is a lot of work, R&D work, uh, commercial work, marketing work around the P. And as you mentioned, Marcel, it's something which is indicating that P is uh, playing a specific role right now in this ingredient world. And I think you similar with the rice, right? If we look at rice, I remember it was about 1%, right? But it comes in there at number, at number exactly. four in terms of the, exactly. the research done. So I think, you know, those, to me, obviously, from that research you've done there, looks like are the two to watch, right? They're the ones that have the, the biggest potential to be uh, market changing. I think exactly. important for our clients as well here that obviously following these research and these trends to kind of keep an eye on rice and pea in particular. And I yeah. think that also drives the point of why we're focusing on certainly pea with our price assessment and bring transparency into that market for everybody. Yeah. So you perfectly understood this, uh, this slide. Yeah, exactly. And on the opposite, you see a lot of commerce, newcomers, but having just one references. And the question is, is it really durable? Uh, will they be able to survive? Do they have a, the right price, the right quantity, the good access to the raw material? So that's a challenge. So pay attention when you select something, uh, 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 make sure that uh, the product will be available in future. Coming back to this list, um, if you make stats on that, uh, the products are presented in flour, concentrate, isolate or hydrolysates. 40% of these products are claiming to be functional and you see that they can be texturizing agent, fat binders or water binders, uh, good, having good solubility, good emulsifying, gelling, viscosity, forming. So again, they try to promote uh, some qualities which can be linked to also the price. And I will come back uh, on that later. 29% so, uh, are claiming to be nutritional, 30% are claiming to have a, a positive organoleptic impact. 
uh, GMO and, uh, or, and organic can also be uh, part of the claim that people are putting uh, in front of, um, of these products. So, uh, in fact, we are arriving to the end of this presentation I and I want you uh, to, to try to, to, to consider the, the major points that we, tr we try to share right now uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar. So first, the uh, alternative protein market is, uh, is rapidly developing, but customers are expecting blunt-based product to match their, their, their needs uh, and um, they expect that uh, the, the, the new plant-based product will replace uh, as much as they can the, the animal-based product. So that's a challenge because we know that plant-based protein are not having the same composition than animal-based. So a lot of developments are going on right now just to try to, to duplicate uh, all these uh, animal-based properties. The second thing is uh, uh, multiple sources is, 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 is good um, uh, because as you have seen before, um, th there is a, a multiple uh, numbers of uh, uh, players, uh, raw material able to enter in this game, but uh, they don't have the same potential because as we mentioned, some are limited in quantity, some are containing maybe some anti-nutritional anti factors, some are, have not the same uh, uh, amino acid balance. So a lot of elements needs to be uh, considered in order to select the, 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 best, uh, the best candidate. And the, and the last message also is about plant-based protein diversity, because I'm, I'm thinking about future and future generation. We need to modify uh, the, the, the farming practices. Uh, to to give uh, to to make them more durable, more sustainable, and it's important to introduce the the plant-based diversity in order to be able to to diversify the the the, the crop production and and to 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 make uh, farming practices much better for future. So that's the message, uh, Marcel. That I want to share with you and with all of you. I think it's it's a very good uh, I think introduction to plant-based proteins. Um, where they come from, how, how we obviously arrive at the isolates, the concentrates. And I think this will be a perfect building block for what we are um, obviously going to record just to, just to, in, in another day or so when we really look at the cost structure of the plant-based proteins. Obviously, I hope we all now understand a little bit more about pea proteins, about the soya, about wheat. But now let's look in the next session, really, um, where's the price difference and, and where does that price difference come from? So um, speak to you very soon. Uh, Denis, thank you very much for your introduction and your first take on this webinar. And um, stay tuned for the second set. Thank you very much. Thank you.